Chapter Nine of Betty Baird's Ventures by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Nine: Betty and Craig. Aren't you perfectly crazy about going on that cruise? Asked Betty of Craig, who was hurrying up to the veranda where Betty sat reading the last copy of the Garden Magazine. Your father told me about it last evening at the station craig declined the chair betty motioned him to i'm in a great hurry he explained for we leave at two to-morrow and i have everything to get ready i must ship my clams and see to the garden i came over to tell you about that spray for your grapes oh thank you how kind when you have so many things on your mind answered betty gratefully can't i help you in some way craig looked very solemn then with a hearty blush said why betty for pity's sake clammerboy what's the matter why this perturbation yes actually blushing craig laughed but evidently found it hard to speak he dropped down on the top step and twirled his red cap viciously looking in every direction but at betty his face had a haunted sheepish expression that must be dick jervis's boat he said with a rapt look now craig you might as well bring it out first as last said betty firmly and not pretend you are interested in that old tub you have seen for years well betty to tell the truth i am not so glad to go out on this cruise as you seem to think oh oh cried betty incredulously craig threw down his cap disgustedly it's those blamed excuse me swells who are going they are all college boys and i am well you know i have not been fifty miles away from this island the bitter truth was out at last betty turned her eyes away for they were filled with tears she remembered those first weeks at the pines when straight from weston she felt so strange among those fashionable rich schoolgirls how could she help the boy she felt immeasurably older and wiser than craig in other circumstances she would have laughed him out of his sensitiveness but her own experience was still too vivid in her mind to allow her to pass this over lightly a gentleman is a gentleman everywhere she began rather tentatively it is not being a gentleman but what is that you are always getting off being au fait it is being up to social stunts and not feeling as green as that pine tree and about as stiff i know i understand said betty earnestly the clamor boy looked at her half resentfully no you don't he said so emphatically as to be almost rude you had all those years at the pines where you learned everything betty looked at him hastily she wondered if she had been a bore talking about the pines had she been a trifle upstartish i suppose i have talked a good deal about the pines she began in a meek little tone that was to be changed instantly if she discovered malice in his remark yes you have he answered absently well the lad glanced up in surprise well what he asked i hate to bore people bore people what has that to do with it you insinuated that i talked too much about the pines and boasted about what i had learned there my but girls are quick i never thought of such a thing oh well then i'll forgive you and we won't talk about it any more what worries you most she continued in a tone of high sisterly interest oh everything they do is different from the way our hobart boys do the way they shrug up their shoulders and put their hands in their pockets and they have their own way of talking as you talk about playing on the campus and things like that we all know they are your ways of saying college things it puts me out not to know some of these expressions and to have to answer back like a book that new suit of yours is just the thing said betty irrelevantly trying to bring comfort the lad brightened i thought it had that big baggy square look like that harvard fellows who saved your life yes and your new cap has the right look have you yachting shoes yes and new neckties too not a red one i hope said betty a red necktie always gives me the impression that a boy wants to be real wicked and doesn't know how 
no i didn't get a red one i'll be all right on the boat for i know as much about sailing as they do more maybe the trouble is we are going ashore at several places and go to dances and meet people girls the despair in his voice was poignant well you are not afraid of me said betty encouragingly you are different said craig there is no nonsense about you thank you she said betty was not sure whether to take this for a compliment or not it seemed a little hard that at her age she could not inspire the same dread as these other girls very likely younger and not half as up in things as she was well girls always like boys who keep off their hats when they are talking to them these yale fellows keep theirs on and smoke too not before ladies said betty scandalized yes and the girls seem to like it he said moodily if i were in your place craig ellsworth i'd not be afraid of such girls who said i was afraid demanded craig embittered by his own puzzled state of feelings girls like an ironical smile i have heard dozens of them rave over reginald hopkins because he has that easy way and slow ironical smile craig looked bothered i haven't time to learn anything new no said betty thoughtfully you wouldn't have time to learn an ironical smile anyway it wouldn't suit you but girls dote on it if i only had the way tom haley has of answering people back as quick as lightning said craig dolefully repartee asked betty craig nodded despairingly repartee it isn't necessary to talk if you listen everyone simply adores a good listener girls are usually perfectly willing to do all the talking why the most popular boy at kip academy you know it is in the same town as the pines never said a single solitary word he just laughed uproariously at everything we said he would laugh and then wipe his face with his handkerchief every time he brought out that handkerchief i felt like a wit oh he was simply fascinating now poor craig was the solemnest of boys and could have achieved the ironical smile in a much shorter time than this abandonment of mirth this riot of laughter and bonhomie he shook his head hopelessly there your shaking your head that way made me think of a plan there was timothy wainwright we girls were awfully afraid of him he certainly was the wisest boy at kipps and the only thing he ever did was to nod his head in that slow thoughtful way and that was as flattering as any laugh we stood in awe of timothy he sounds like a jackass to me eating timothy said craig in his sombre scornful way betty laughed you are hard to please i have brought out all my choicest wares and none suits your fastidious taste i'd hate to pretend it wouldn't really hurt you craig to laugh heartily occasionally said betty with candor it is i should think only a natural way to express your appreciation as for being a good listener that is common or uncommon politeness mother always tells me to forget myself when i happen to feel feel betty paused she had hurt the boy's feelings before by intimating that he was afraid and now she feared to use the word timid you know the way you feel now unaccustomed she finished i think it's their slang and easy attitudes that make it hard it seems priggish to stand stiff when they are so limber i don't smoke either i should hope not yes it is hard to be on the outside of things they were silent for a moment of course you couldn't wear an overcoat with a fur collar said betty dreamily while she pulled a honeysuckle sprig and twirled it absent-mindedly a fur collar in this kind of weather what do you mean exclaimed and demanded craig in one breath wiping the sweat from his forehead oh i was just thinking that men with fur collars on their overcoats somehow seem different it would be the thing if you could but of course you can't she added hastily they make men look like ambassadors or actors such wild conjectures were so distant from craig's mental horizon that they did not even skirt it long enough for him to come down on betty for her truly girl-like inconsequence 
i know you don't care for popularity resumed betty and craig gave a snort of disgust you simply don't want to seem queer and attract attention really craig if you are just as you are with me only a little more flattering perhaps you will pass then my manners are not altogether bad you have good manners you always keep your hat off when speaking to a lady you never sit when a lady is standing you don't interrupt when i am talking that's nice of you and above all you don't take out your watch before me i think i can forgive almost any breach of manners sooner than that betty you are a good one said craig with genuine gratitude i feel better i know you know the real thing though you never have any airs neither has lois here comes lois now isn't she too lovely you won't find anyone ahead of her which ear is burning lois end of chapter nine recording by holly jensen chapter ten of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter ten a returned manuscript dear madam we thank you for the privilege of examining the accompanying manuscript and regret that it does not meet our requirements its return does not necessarily imply that it is without literary merit and may not find a market elsewhere respectfully yours the atlantic monthly betty read through the coldly courteous slip without a break but at the end she swallowed quickly that lump in the throat that seems in some mysterious way to be the source of our tears she ran up to her room threw herself on the window seat flinging her arms on the window sill and cried heartbrokenly mrs baird and lois who had listened to the reading of the slip remained on the porch shall i go up asked lois with solicitude no it is better for her to cry out her disappointment alone yet how i long to run up and kiss away her trouble as i did when she was a baby lois went over to mrs baird's side and smoothed her hair gently it must be hard when you find the trouble too heavy for kissing away but betty will soon get over this you know she never allows anything to down her very long i knew she could not possibly have anything accepted by the great magazines but it seemed better to allow her to try her strength her greatest desire now is to help her father after a good cry betty felt better she wiped her eyes and leaned out of the window to cool her face and smell the sweetness of the flowers the old-fashioned garden came home to the young spirit as never before it spoke to her of lives well spent even though they were lives that had had a narrow compass the boxwood beaten by wind and rain yielding up its bitter-sweet tang was to her fancy the fragrance of their memories like strains of far-off music so shall thy memory be like the fragrance of boxwood shall thy memory be such a solemn fragrance she said leaning still farther out to follow the box winding away to the white gate in prim plump bunches mrs baird and lois waited suddenly mrs baird felt two strong young arms around her neck and a cheek as soft and smooth as satin lying against her own mother i do believe you are worrying it is all right i might have known how it would be it was downright conceited to send anything there i'll stick to my garden and preserves who wouldn't be contented with such a stock of goodies dear dear child said mrs baird drawing betty down on her lap i am too heavy for you mother let me lean my arm on your knee said betty she sat down on the step and leaning her folded arms on her mother's lap looked up into the tender face now this is comfy she said but carissima you must not take my disappointment so hard i am going to make my way see if i don't and the old atlantic and the pacific too can't keep me from succeeding i felt all along that it was an impossible beginning and it seemed cruel to let you try only to be disappointed no it was not as if you could be cruel anyway i felt worse over the pickle failure 
that seemed such a meek beginning that i could not believe the envious god's success would call me down i must try and try again betty sat up straight with determination written on every feature on the mobile mouth so given to laughter the daintily upturned nose the firm round chin while it flashed from the dark eyes that laughed and cried at once those deep wistful child eyes that drew hearts to her you see i did get my mother's cookery journal to publish something i'll be more modest and stick to katie's literature she laughed gaily and began at once to plan another article why i may become an editor who knows of one of those departments everything now is photographed and i can take pictures even if i can't write essays i saw a notice of a prize of ten dollars in the girl's own page for photographs of the prettiest girl's bedroom i shall send a picture of mine excellent applauded mrs baird delighted that betty could begin again with such enthusiasm it's the very thing cried lois won't we have fun arranging the room scrumptious agreed betty what do you say to taking in the picture as much as we can of the bookshelves my desk and the chest of drawers perhaps we can manage to get in the pretty dressing-table too with this prize i shall have made eleven dollars and twenty-five cents minus stamps counting the article on a nook in my garden asked mrs baird who could hardly keep track of betty's receipts yes and i haven't the least fear of not getting this prize everyone says my room is so attractive and original too in many ways by this time betty was standing up all alive with energy and her face lighted by the lamplight shining from the hall where old katie had placed the student lamp was bright and eager it is so good to do things mother she cried i'll begin tomorrow and arrange my room to the best advantage i must get the picture in before the middle of the month dr baird hearing their voices came out on the veranda betty brought a shawl for her mother's shoulders and together they sat in the cool evening this is indeed a marvellously beautiful spot said the doctor i wish i had more time to enjoy it wait until i'm one of the editors of my mother's cookery journal cried betty then you can give up going to the city and live out here all the time and write books latin ones that is a very attractive prospect daughter said the doctor smiling affectionately on her and patting her head father began betty after a long silence and in the dark her cheeks grew crimson they the atlantic sent back my essay on twilight the doctor showed no particular surprise indeed what do you propose to do now he asked i shan't give up literature for one disappointment betty declared no doubt i began too high on the ladder and so i shall start on a more modest round my mother's cookery journal and shall send a prize photograph of my bedroom that sounds promising answered her father and the darkness hid the smile of pride he felt in her pluck and resolution i shall go over my essays again and see if there is not something that will do for the magazines i am writing a short story dotty makes such a love of a baby heroine i am indeed pleased to see that your zeal has not waned because of a single disappointment oh i couldn't give up you know for i love to write and then in time something is bound to be accepted the next morning betty and lois studied the prize room from every point in order to secure the most artistic picture they put the chairs into new places moved tables shifted the magazines on the table made the literary table more literary rearranged pictures and brasses put flowers into quaint receptacles and patted the pillows and threw them with studied carelessness on the window seat there exclaimed betty in a tone of finality and she stood in the doorway and surveyed the results of their efforts i think that is simply perfect now if i can get a good photograph of it i know it will win the prize i am sure it will win said lois with quick sympathy it is certainly the most charming room i ever saw and how could it help being with such an occupant and lois ended with a profound bow to betty flatterer said betty with a severely reproving look now for the photograph 
now for the grand work of art from which miss elizabeth baird some time of weston pennsylvania is to reap fame and fortune end of chapter ten recording by holly jensen chapter eleven of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter eleven preserves aren't these too lovely for anything exclaimed betty warm and red from preserving her pears her english breakfast marmalade yet smiling brightly and proudly as she poured the golden syrup into the last jar the smell of spices and burnt sugar filled the room a bee attracted by the delicious odor buzzed at a window your preserves are a beautiful color they are like your grandmother's i can hardly believe you made them answered her mother i hear father going out on the porch i must call him and exploit his good fortune in having such a domestic daughter betty skipped to the door father do come here and see what i have made dr baird stepped in rather gingerly he never felt at home in a kitchen and a man who could do any cooking he considered a miss nancy no welsh rabbit for the old-time clergyman no chafing dish messes there was a thick high wall between the pursuits of the sexes his face brightened with genuine pleasure while he gazed on the twenty-five jars of preserves towards which betty pointed with a proud possessive hand you are following in the footsteps of your mother and grandmother he said preserve making is becoming an unknown art in these days of ready-made stuffs i shall soon be able to make your shirts for you father answered betty with a merry smile everybody laughed including the doctor himself for he had never had a ready-made shirt and declared that no gentleman of his young manhood had ever worn a pair of detached cuffs this grievance with the dress of the present day had grown into a pleasant family joke and dr baird replied to betty's chaffing by turning back his coat sleeves ostentatiously displaying his handsome cuffs as he took up a jar of preserves and held it to the light i think you ought to give mrs ellsworth a sample of your culinary art also our pastor's wife he suggested he put down the jar and gave the handsome group a last gratified look yes i shall lois and i are going to the ellsworth this evening and i want to take one to miss hunt too we can go into the village to-morrow and take them to the manse and the library as you are going out you might take a jar to that poor woman we heard about who lives alone there on the edge of the marsh mrs baird said i shall give john two or three bottles for his wife for she has had a hard time all summer with sickness here is lois what do you think of them lois they are stunning bet exclaimed lois examining the preserves i must save several jars for your father lois he will be surprised that i can do things like this father thinks you can do anything i was almost jealous one evening hearing him laud you to the skies to one of his old friends colonel mason the colonel said he would like to meet such a paragon did he call me a paragon how delightfully bookish and old-timish it gives me a romantic feeling about myself as if i might have stepped out of the children of the abbey though of course i know it was only his gallant way of praising your friend of saying what we all think of you added lois throwing her arms impulsively around betty together they went out to the porch betty blushing under the fire of compliments and arm in arm the two friends walked across the yard to the seat under the cedar tree now jokingly called betty's nook in my garden in honor of the one article that had been accepted when do you think your article will appear in the journal asked lois as they sat down i want to buy several copies one for father and one for colonel mason who is quite lonely in his great old mansion outside of baltimore then i've told a number of people about your writing and i want to give copies to them they all think it is so interesting then we must send them to jess and the other pines girls of course you will send one to miss green i am scared at the idea of miss green seeing it you know how artistic she is she must have one and indeed all the teachers must have copies for they are proud of you 
i don't see why they are it's only your kind partial way of seeing it lois darling but it would be a good idea to send them to our crowd and show the girls where we are how i wish i could see mary livingstone what a magnificent woman she must be it seems strange to think of her as married of course you received an announcement of her wedding yes have you seen her husband no they went to europe immediately i haven't heard from her for a long time wasn't it nice that she should marry dorothy king's brother they were always friends at school though mary was older it was a warm day and the girl sat lazily in the shade of the old tree talking over school days and the history of the month since they graduated snatches of conversation alternated with long comfortable silences while the friends intertwined ribbon grass into necklaces or raved over the beauty of the rose of sharon now in luxuriant bloom from this distance the pink rose of sharon and the brownish gray of the trunk and branches make it like a real piece of tapestry lois gazed with interest at the picture betty pointed out she knew that betty was always seeing wonderful effects and today's hazy atmosphere had so softened the flowers and trees that the likeness to an ancient bit of tapestry was not far-fetched i never saw anyone so delighted with effects as you are bet you ought to be an artist you are an artist she added i sometimes think that i have the love and the emotions of one but lack the skill it takes more than appreciation to paint betty sat with her hands clasped about one knee looking in serene enjoyment at a lapful of honeysuckle and roses which she had been putting together first one way then another as her fancy dictated over the dainty shining head lois dropped the long ribbon grass necklace she had braided Today the two young girls formed a picture that gladdened everyone who glanced into the old-fashioned garden from the roadway a picture of youth and health and friendship and beauty to an unusual degree but above all the beauty that comes from character endeared them even to the casual passer-by they spoke in the subdued tones that the warm day naturally evoked yet with a ring of merriment and good feeling betty was especially gay possessing a sense of positive affluence owing to the twenty-five beautiful jars of pear preserves in the pantry the pillared house nestled placidly in the shadows of the tall protecting pines trees that had been growing there years before the now ancient dwelling had found its place beneath their heavy boughs hummingbirds flitted with prismatic flash from flower to flower oh the beauty of it exclaimed betty outside a great red touring car came puffing up look alexander at that charming old house do stop slow up cried one of the occupants whose numerous veils almost hid her face i'm crazy about such houses the car stopped and the speaker unaware of the two girls seated behind the cedar and further hidden by the great snowball bush continued alexander it's beautiful i'd love to own it can we buy it let us go in and make them an offer for it mary what a child you are said a deep masculine voice how would you like someone to come to our place and beg it out of hand we'd think it jolly fresh alexander you always show your profession by your class of arguments retorted the feminine voice behind the tree betty and lois were laughing silently and grasping each other's hands to keep from making any sign that they were there for it seemed like a good joke on that warm lazy day the masculine voice made some response in a lower key now alexander king don't be foolish answered the woman's voice betty started up lois tried to hold her down you will spoil it all she cautioned in a whisper it's mary livingstone betty answered running quickly to the gate why there's betty baird oh betty betty where in the world did you come from cried the voice from the car dropped from the sky just as you have mary livingstone king betty cried with both hands outstretched and smiling brightly she glanced towards the young husband who was gazing open-eyed with surprise and curiosity so this was the betty baird his wife and sister had talked about by jove i don't blame em he thought 
he looked at her more closely for a more radiant girl could not be found than betty standing by the car her great eyes dancing and deepening while she clung to her beloved mary livingstone's hand do get out she begged lois is here oh lois it is mary we were talking about you when you came talk about angels said mr king with an admiring glance at his handsome wife and you hear the rustle of their wings or in this age the tooting of their motor-car indeed i shall come in said mary preparing to get out i have so much to hear about and to tell then you know i have a husband to show off and of course miss baird we have come to buy this house whether you want to sell it or not as you must have heard said mr king gravely with a sly look at his wife there was a general laugh at mary's expense well said mary laughing i did fall in love with it at first sight but of course i wouldn't take it from dear little betty baird mary threw her arm lovingly over betty's shoulder how tall you are i always think of you as small because you were when you first came to the pines they were now walking up to the portico what a divine place she breathed her glance going out to the water then coming back to the shadowy garden it's a bully place ejaculated mr king how long have you been here i'm frightfully at a loss for news about my friends said mary we came here about three months ago i am glad you like the dear old house and garden i miss my mountains the water is a poor substitute have you a boat asked mr king there is bully sailing in this harbor and out in the bay even if you don't go clear out to the sound play golf mary laughed now you see how we spend our time we are either motoring or swimming or golfing or sailing or riding or driving once in a long while we read a book that is fine and out of doorish i am beginning to think i would rather be a good sportswoman than write a good book listen to our intellectual betty baird isn't that treason lois cried mary clasping the two girls hands now i'll call mother and have katie make lemonade or would you prefer ice water betty asked i vote for lemonade said mr king it's deuced hot to-day you know our hall is the coolest spot in the country won't you come in yes it will rest our eyes said mary and they trooped in oh this hall is ideal perfectly ideal cried mary and she dropped into a capacious antique sofa covered with restful green katie with her ample form swathed in a white apron and a red and yellow bandana about her head soon brought in a huge canton ware bowl filled to the brim with the lemonade and a few additions in the way of fruit according to a recipe of her own she put it down on the table and betty with mr king's hearty assistance opened a nest of little mahogany tables for glasses and cake dishes then old katie her uplifted chin denoting that she had a final test of quality brought in the prized sponge cake i never tasted such delicious cake were the words she heard from the beautifully dressed stranger when she waited a moment behind the door to hear the usual encomiums grinning with pride she went with as light tread as her two hundred pounds would allow to prepare dinner soon there was a quiet step on the broad staircase and mrs baird came down in a cool and refreshing-looking gown of pale gray that with her fast-turning hair gave that air of gentleness and sweetness which was a part of her personality she was delighted to see betty's school heroine if there isn't jack brooks called out mr king a tall figure vaulted from the back of a superb black kentucky thoroughbred at the gate and hurried buoyantly up the path do you know him mrs king asked betty laughingly bringing out the new name yes miss baird answered mary with emphasis on the name betty went to the door and opening wide the screen shook hands cordially with the newcomer saying there are some friends of yours here mr brooks why jack old man where in the blazes did you drop from demanded mr king you better answer for yourself old chap jack laughed back we are original long islanders living in our ancestral home are you still in westchester 
no we have bought a place about five miles from here betty clapped her hands how lovely to have you near she said to mary and her voice spoke volumes it is certainly delightful to find you here said mary warmly and lois is going to spend a great deal of her time with us and we can organize a regular pines club said betty a pines club what a sylvan sound is it for the preservation of our forests that are being so ruthlessly and jack paused significantly in his jocularity i am sure mr brooks that i told you that we had attended the pines a boarding school on the hudson answered betty smiling would you admit men to your club at least you will alexander and myself as honorary members that's good cried mr king pounding his knee i'd like to see jack brooks a member of a girls boarding school club that raised a laugh i should like to know on what grounds mr brooks thinks he ought to be made an honorary member asked lois we may have other applications lois you surprise me for heroism of course laughed betty heroism jack brooks a hero well that's a good one jacky old man what heroic stunt have you been doing asked mr king jovially twould ill become me to speak of my small services responded jack bending his head low in mock humility ask miss baird betty related graphically the details of the incident of the runaway pony the recital causing great hilarity i believe jack that you frightened that pony purposely said mary gleefully it will be the fashion to have pony cart accidents if you two tell this story often where were you miss bird when all this was going on asked mr king fortunately i had not come yet it would not have been half so effective with two heroines let me warn you not to go out alone in that cart i see another adventure in brooks's eyes mr king answered during this raillery betty asked mary to go upstairs to see her room since she had admired the downstairs so heartily soon the two friends were in the window seat don't you get lonely out here you always had a crowd around you at the pines mary asked yes it was lonely only grown-up things and people everywhere until lois came and you know i never pretend to be grown up i used to long to hear someone laugh the way jess did that nonsensical giggle that we teased her about mother and i are great friends and it was only occasionally i felt the need of being downright silly then i have a good way of keeping busy i am making money making money said mary in surprise how can you out here i am working on the next thing principle doing the thing nearest at hand and it's perfectly delightful it makes you feel so strong and valuable in the morning to get awake with some project in your mind what are you doing asked mary interested at once it is principally betty hesitated blushing over the confession principally literature literature now mary you said that just the way father does betty tried hard to look vexed but the interest in the subject was too appealing yes l-i-t-e-r-a-t-u-r-e -E. mary laughed as betty pounded out the letters and she gave her hand an understanding squeeze i got a dollar and twenty-five cents for an article in my mother's cookery journal that is a beginning said mary encouragingly we must begin at the bottom of the ladder my mary how old marriage makes a girl that too is exactly what father said betty threw her arm over mary's shoulder to take away in one of their old schoolgirl hugs any irritation that her laughing words might cause i'm three years older you must remember missy mary answered loftily well i don't care if you are married and three years older i shall love you as much as ever thank you said mary dryly with a twinkle in her eyes at the attitude betty unconsciously assumed towards her as of one wholly superannuated by the mere fact of being married and consequently unable to enter into the aspirations and delights of a girl in the blissful state of singleness you are the same mary and there is no one like you except betty cried out catching the twinkle now don't begin your conscientious exceptions betty mary protested 
it would take too long and would destroy my comfortable feeling of supremacy i love your irony there is no one like you in that cried betty what are you about now i made pickles perfectly lovely little pickles and sold them that is some of them finished betty in a rather subdued tone now that was fine exclaimed mary yes betty hesitated but i barely cleared myself i thought there was money in such things i am sorry oh let's not talk about it for i have a fine new scheme a boy on the next farm is helping me with the garden and i am going to make money out of that there is one thing you can do bet said mary looking around the room thoughtfully and that is arrange a room artistically i am glad you like my room i love it up here it is beautiful and your house is one of the most attractive i have been in there is a harmony combined with originality that one seldom finds mary you take my breath away cried betty we have a new house you will come to see me soon won't you and we paid a professional decorator a new york man to furnish it and yet it lacks the look your house has perhaps you could tell me what is wrong with it i know when a thing is wrong but how to remedy it is beyond me betty was not at all abashed at the confidence expressed in her powers absolutely without conceit or vanity she yet possessed limitless enthusiasm and buoyant spirits that always saw success ahead whether she or someone else was to carry out the enterprise success gleamed only a short distance away even while she wiped her eyes over a present failure many girls of betty's age were old or cold or tired betty was always hopeful always eager always seeing something wonderful half hidden below the commonplace it was this fire or clear shining quality like star mist that gave betty her peculiar charm people smiled at her enthusiasm but warmed themselves at its fire miss hunt grew young and rosy as betty talked by her side though she felt she should curb the young heart's high courage and hopes the clammer boy felt that harvard and heidelberg were only matters of a little waiting and working when he and betty talked their long talks of the future the future that capitalized itself as it came from their young lips even jack brooks was beginning to see that there was something in the world besides the opportunity for self-amusement i must pick up in my studies he confided to betty for this is my last year at harvard and i couldn't look you in the face if i flunked yet such was her fortunate temperament that in hitching her wagon to a star she was never lax in the practical detail of the wagon and the hitching and here with her first talk with betty for nearly a year mary was feeling the old charm and glow her own home seemed different she wondered how she came to give it into the hands of a professional decorator when it was such a delight as betty found it to do it for yourself to plan and study and hunt yes betty must come and help her to understand silence had fallen between the two while their minds flew to the new home i shall try to come soon mary will you drop literature and everything else just to come to look over my house betty reddened forgive me mary if i did not seem eager to go i have so many irons in the fire that i do seem a little dazed i have had to turn from one thing to another until i feel like that awful example the rolling stone then craig ellsworth says girls never stick to a thing long enough to give it a fair test why you were always noted for your perseverance betty then you surely haven't given up l i t e r a t u r e spelled mary betty bubbled over with laughter it's frightfully slow except the rejection slips look here betty showed her a box holding every slip she had received from the magazines frankly betty you are too young for l i t but betty had her hand over mary's laughing mouth before another syllable was spelt i must go said mary starting up and they ran down to the hall where there was a great buzz of conversation you won't want us to come often mrs baird if we take up the whole day it has been the greatest pleasure to have you answered mrs baird earnestly taking mary's hand and holding it cordially 
oh mary before you go you must see my pear preserves cried betty dragging her out into the kitchen while the others followed the dainty delicious-looking fruit was admired as extravagantly as anyone could wish betty wrapped up several jars for mary as well as for mrs brooks and with many cheery jokes about sweets to the sweet jack galloped off a few turns of the crank and the kings were speeding down the road end of chapter eleven recording by holly jensen chapter twelve of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter twelve the auction listen to this cried betty rushing into the room where mrs baird and lois were sitting lois at a big table writing to her father and mrs baird engaged with her mending betty flourished a copy of the hobart weekly herald do everybody stop everything and listen to this she went on sitting down while her shining eyes wandered over the pages in search of the particular piece of news with which she wanted to electrify them she proceeded to read a long advertisement of an auction to be held at a farmhouse not far distant at which were to be offered for sale livestock farm implements household furniture and utensils of all sorts she stopped all out of breath and looked from her mother to lois to see the effect of the advertisement well said her mother well said lois well sniffed betty haven't you people any imagination can't you see in these words old mahogany old brass old pewter old samplers old everything that i love and need for this blessed old house with its hundred years old shingles i own to seeing nothing but cattle horrid cattle that browse on your field and bellow and snort and gore you said lois really though doesn't this advertisement in our weekly stir you i'm crazy to go and you will go with me won't you lois have i ever deserted you demanded lois with a reproachful expression in her fine gray eyes no you haven't so come now and let us make up a list of the things we need for i am sure they will have everything and they will go for a song answered betty pulling lois up from her chair and skipping her out of the room the yard of the old ramshackle farmhouse was filled with people from the country around innumerable horses were hitched to the trees by the roadside and the barn overflowed with men in their sunday clothes examining the livestock and talking solemnly together discussing the late van steert's peculiar theories of peach culture and cattle feeding women with babies in their arms sat on all the available steps and on the grass beneath the trees others wandered through the house gossiping and peering curiously into every nook and corner of the shell that had for many years concealed their unsociable neighbors a host of children clattered up and down the staircase and played tag in the dismantled rooms as if something in the wreck of a well-ordered home satisfied their lawless little souls under the horse chestnut tree in front of the house were tables piled high with dishes carpets curtains stovepipes and small articles the van steert home was laid bare to the community it was like a judgment day the old rooms looked pallid and worn as if sick of the glare of the day and the curious eyes betty and lois drove up in the pony cart look cried betty seizing lois with one hand and with the other pulling the pony until he stood on his dainty hind legs what is it see that slope-top desk yes what of it lois it is exactly exactly like the picture of one in that book about old furniture that miss green had at the pines betty's cheeks grew red and her eyes brilliant she tied mary legs to a post and walked hastily up to the porch for the sight of the desk and the crowd was already giving her the genuine auction fever look at that pewter plate and that blue pitcher and those tall brass candlesticks perfect loves every one of them betty spoke below her breath but her smile was rapturous as she picked up the different articles 
i have no doubt they are all good lois replied but for the life of me i can't feel much interest in old things except in a few that we have at home that belong to our own people of course inherited things are best said betty with her eyes fastened on the desk but somehow when it comes to furniture and brasses all grandmothers of the colonial days seem as near to me as my own ancestors it is not family sentiment or pride when it goes so far back but a love for the days the atmosphere the beginnings of our country oh i can't explain it but it's the way i feel there's the auctioneer interjected lois a tall thin old man took his place behind a table under the horse chestnut the crowd gathered about him well within hearing of his powerful voice he first offered for sale a somewhat battered teapot no one would bid above five cents and his ruddy face assumed an expression of pained surprise at such unappreciative bidders he next tempted them with a lot of three a teacup a picture and a frying pan they went for ten cents grief settled like a cloud on his countenance but was lifted when a chromo fetched a dollar though he spoke sorrowfully of the condition of a people who would allow art art to go at a song yet evidently not absolutely hopeless he took up a long-handled mahogany apple butter stirrer and held it aloft this here stirrer has been in the van steert family for many generations what am i bid for it will someone gimme a bid for it he paused and gazed about him the expectation in his face gradually giving way to the habitual one of aggrievedness when there was no response shall i bid whispered betty to lois it must be good from the way he talks what on earth would you do with it asked lois with a hint of practicality though she too was beginning to feel the contagion of the auctioneer's enthusiasm what no one bid on this genuine old antique stirrer that for years and years has stirred apple butter right in this here yard he threw reproachful glances on a generation dull to the promptings of sentiment five cents said betty in a low frightened voice five cents the tone was positively withering five cents for the stir that grandma van steert stirred her apple butter and her peach butter and her pear butter with under these very trees five cents is that all i'm offered betty blushed and hung her head lois turned pale what a fearful mistake they had made every eye was fixed on them the auctioneer flashed lightning-like scorn under his penthouse brows five cents oh the irony and pathos of those words ten called a bold masculine voice and instantly every head turned betty was rescued and she drew a long breath of grateful relief how the people had stared at her and every eye reproached her for offering five cents only five cents for grandmother van steert's apple butter stirrer now those baleful eyes were turned on the man on the edge of the crowd to whom the stirrer was finally knocked down at ten cents nimbly and apparently wholeheartedly the auctioneer went to the next lot the pair of fascinating candlesticks i am going to get them for your mother breathed lois in a low tense whisper lovely whispered back betty not turning her eyes from the brilliant objects after spirited bidding the brass candlesticks were knocked down to lois for one dollar and seventy-five cents then betty for forty-five cents secured the pewter plate she had seen by that time the girls were thoroughly possessed by the auction fever every movement of the auctioneer's hand every change in the tone of his voice as he pleaded or scolded or cajoled or praised things he was selling incited them to bid one would bid excitedly on nearly every article offered until the other would bring her to her senses by insisting on her withdrawing from a contest for anything so useless but invariably the other would bid the next time until she in turn was persuaded to desist thus with one comparatively cool head between them they contrived to get through a number of sales without having made a purchase then the slope-top desk was put up 
now ladies and gentlemen the auctioneer shouted now i'm about to offer you one of the most valuable pieces in this here whole collection grandpa van steert's old desk take a good look at it and he waved his arm invitingly towards it as two men lifted it up on the table where all could see thar it is he continued just look at them handles on there brass they are and there's three big drawers made a good solid oak too he assured them as he pulled one of them out and pounded it convincingly with his fist and in there and he let down the lid in there is a lot of little drawers and here's where you write fine desk that is solid as a rock what am i offered he turned briskly to the crowd with an air of confident expectation one dollar cried a man off to the left one twenty-five instantly came a feminine voice then there was a brief pause what the auctioneer exclaimed one twenty-five is that what i'm offered for grandpa van steert's old desk look at them big drawers again you could put a whole lot of things in them drawers now i tell you and look at them nice little drawers to put pins and buttons and sewin things in and there's a place for pens and for ink i haven't a particle of doubt ladies and gentlemen that it was at that very desk that grandpa van steert writ that famous piece of hisn that was published in the gentleman farmer about twenty-five or thirty year back on peach tree culture i mind that piece well and to think that today i'm actually offered one twenty-five for that desk somebody offer more surely there's someone here who'd give more than one twenty-five for that old desk would someone offer me five at least he pleaded he looked searchingly into the faces nearest to him and catching betty's eyes he said nodding encouragingly make it five involuntarily betty nodded in return thank you miss he said five i'm offered five 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 i'm offered anybody make it six do i hear six six called out the man on the left six i'm offer seven betty interrupted him half rising from her chair i'll go up to ten but not a cent more she said to lois and she sank back seven fifty a feminine voice called that's the one twenty five woman whispered lois nine shouted the man on the left ten instantly cried betty standing up entirely regardless of the next crane towards her lois rose at the same time with a curious expression twelve fifty offered the man on the left poor betty her high hopes gone collapsed into her seat lois remained standing and moved behind betty's chair now this is something like exclaimed the auctioneer and he fairly smacked his lips over the unexpected bid twelve fifty i'm offered twelve fifty twelve fifty somebody make it fifteen lois raised her hand slightly so that betty could not see and inclined her head fifteen i'm offered the old man cried almost joyously fifteen dollars fifteen fifteen i'm offered somebody make it sixteen am i offered sixteen fifteen i'm offered anybody make it sixteen the bid's against you mister won't you make it sixteen he asked the man on the left the man shook his head no you can count me out he grunted fifteen i'm offered fifteen fifteen any more offers at fifteen going going gone at fifteen to the young lady over thar he finished pointing his long finger in the direction of the girls let us go lois i don't want to stay any longer do you someone back here got my desk i wonder who could have taken that desk from me groaned betty she jumped up and started away i'll stay here while you get merrylegs ready bet lois answered wait for me i'll be there in a minute while betty was preparing for the drive home lois hurriedly paid for the desk and arranged to have it sent to dr baird's house early the same evening betty and lois occupied the dinner hour telling about the bargains they had seen at the auction betty could not quite get over losing the desk it was beautiful mother and such a bargain she kept repeating i am sorry you couldn't get it elizabeth said her father oh betty wanted everything there dr baird laughed lois you have very little to say answered betty you bid on an old broken cup and saucer i still believe it was lois doffed lois maintained 
it's queer father the way it takes hold of one betty said reminiscently i felt i had to bid for everything everything seemed so cheap and desirable that old auctioneer has wonderful magnetism it takes a good deal of dramatic ability to be a successful auctioneer i sometimes drop into the auction rooms on fifth avenue when passing and i have been amazed at the gift one of the auctioneers possesses it is worth while going simply to hear him he's a brilliant man i don't believe i'll ever miss another auction said betty leave your purse at home her father advised her rising from dinner they wandered as usual to the front porch and were talking over the day when jack brooks rode up on his black horse what is that long thing he has over his shoulder asked lois who was the first to see him he dismounted at the gate and marched up the path to the little group with grandma van steert's apple butter stir decked with white and blue ribbons sloped over his shoulder everyone stood up laughing when he halted at the steps after many years of wandering in strange lands he announced in a sing-song voice i have found the golden apple butter stirrer may i lay it at the feet of the most renowned and noble lady betty famous and beloved for her peerless pear preserves betty stepped forward with the dignity of a lady fair in the days of chivalry receiving her knight-errant she bowed slowly low and very graciously then extended her hand and took the implement holding it erect as if it were the standard of a medieval army i thank thee most exalted most brave most excellent one for this noble deed for the offering of this gorgeous and transcendent apple butter stirrer with another gracious bow betty turned towards the house and then dropping her regal manner began swinging the ladle swiftly round and round and the white and blue of the pine swirled out in the breeze and she started to sing soon joined by the others here's to the dear old pines like a flash lois snatched a crimson cord from a cushion and tied it to the stirrer jack bowed double in acknowledgment of the compliment to his university while the girls started in with fair harvard as the evening was cool they went into the hall and john brought logs for the fireplace where they added their merry crackle and sparkle to the gay company college songs were sung and even the doctor's deep voice joined loyally when betty opened his own college songbook accompanied sometimes with the piano sometimes with lois's guitar while the gaiety was at its height there was a banging at the brass knocker and two men carried into the hall the desk that had fascinated betty at the auction why that's my desk she cried but it doesn't belong here she added turning to the men who were straightening their backs from the load we didn't buy it you have made a mistake one of the men looked at the tag miss betty baird he read that's you ain't it miss what does it mean cried betty looking from one to another until she came to lois in whose eyes she saw the explanation you she began but could not finish for lois was at her side with her arms around her it's a birthday present betty i was so glad to find out what you wanted when you stopped bidding i began oh you darling cried betty kissing her it is too wonderful to believe well i'll be hanged jack brooks exclaimed they turned to him in surprise why what is wrong mr brooks betty asked was it you that was bidding on that old desk i didn't care for it myself but if i had known you wanted it miss bird wouldn't have had a ghost of a chance end of chapter twelve recording by holly jensen Chapter Thirteen of Betty Baird's Ventures by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Thirteen. We regret. Betty sat brooding under the cedar and watching, half unconsciously, the side of the house on which fell this early September day the shadows of the Lombardy poplar, growing thin and wavering the lily leaves where the madonna lilies had bloomed palely in the shadow of a sunken stone wall that divided the flower garden from the meadows were curling and brown 
summer had gone and with the summer had gone her hopes of doing anything to help her father he must carry the burden of the mortgage alone how much better if she had been a boy and could put a shoulder to the wheel a whiff of late honeysuckle came to her she turned listlessly to see where it was hidden and found it among the virginia creeper that encircled a dead tree she pulled out a spray and held it to her face it doesn't stop blooming even if it is hidden away among the gorgeous creepers apparently of no use she said aloud but the philosophy did not help her betty was heartsick half an hour before she had gone blithely into the pantry to take her preserves to the grocer to her dismay she found only half a dozen jars where a short time before twenty-five had reigned it took away her breath what had become of them gradually she put this and that together a gift here more gifts there until f o friendship's offering had consumed them there could be no income from her pear preserves that was settled like the pickles they had failed upstairs on the literary-looking table was a pile of rejection slips literature too had failed how easily one of those rejections might have been an acceptance she had tried hard she had written faithfully on every subject that she could think of she had photographed everything that had artistic value she had written and rewritten essays yet in flowed rejection slips in unbroken succession mrs baird and lois were in the city and alone betty felt more than ordinarily the oppression of failure in all her efforts a cow lamented in the distance no one was in sight john had taken merrylegs and driven into the village for feed the sunshine grew paler on the ancient shingles and even the crimson butterfly that floated in the open could not mitigate the pallor of the approaching autumn evening her garden yes perhaps that was a success her mother and her father often praised the vegetables that had come from it but would she make any money out of it she had sold a good deal of produce to her grocer she probably would sell more possibly she could make something from the garden at least it looked hopeful john broke into the midst of her thoughts by coming up with several letters two she recognized at once they were long well-filled envelopes with three two-cent stamps on each more we regrets she exclaimed dispiritedly opening them each contained a rejection slip as freshly agonizing as on that first day when twilight came back there was never even a line of encouragement betty could have bloomed on a personal letter from an editor but the hopelessness of these impersonal notes always made her heart sink and sink and to-day with her empty pantry shelf and two slips to add to her quaint collection she felt a physical weakness come over her she tore the slips into tiny pieces she would save them no longer she was done with literature betty opened the letter marked hobart it contained an itemized bill for fertilizer seeds and garden utensils the sum total made her gasp in the light of these terrible figures the garden was the worst failure of all oh this is too much she cried aloud there is some mistake it never rains but it pours but not like this in real life there must be a mistake she read the bill over and over again carefully and a look of intense pain crossed her face then suddenly she ran to her boat she had forgotten her oars no matter she would paddle with the steering oar she kept in the boat anything to get away for a while the harbor was calm and betty's boat drifted idly with the tide nature with her smiling mood of water and sky was evidently not sympathetic and poor betty looked up into the sky with troubled eyes asking some solution to the world-old sorrows and anxieties of life we regret a flock of birds hovered over her a second and then sped swiftly across the water betty could hear we regret in the sound of their chirpings and pipings as they scurried by little waves washed against the boat betty paddled absently everything she touched turned to failure why wasn't she a boy 
there was the money due on the house this month and she had heard sober conferences between her father and mother about ways and means she knew they were harassed and here she was not only useless but adding to their troubles by this garden bill betty's grief was very genuine and oppressive the young have no perspective they lack that experience which gives a sense of proportion they cannot compare one ill one sorrow with another and say this is a trifle compared to that which i have passed through so to-day when betty with all the power of her young generous heart longed to help her father came this blighting failure with no gleam of hope to lighten it every door was closed to her she threw down the oar and resting her elbows on her knees she covered her face with her hands she would drift with the tide it soothed her to be out in the open between sky and water with the boat rocking with the waves a soft breeze sprang up and urged it on and on how calm it was and silent no sound reached her ears save the lapping of the water against the side of her skiff without opening her eyes she slid down on the bottom and rested her head upon the pillow on the seat for a long while she lay there so absorbed in her thoughts of failure that she was oblivious to the changing scenes above and around her until she felt the boat rock with a quicker motion she opened her eyes and sat up the wind had changed from south to west and had blown her far from shore the cloud in the west at first no larger than a man's hand had grown threatening and zigzag clouds low over the hills met it with a terrible power in their torn purple edges the wind from the north sped across the water and roused it from the quiet ripples into waves that shook her light craft into shuddering motion betty jumped up quickly and with her short oar paddled vigorously towards home she soon saw however that she must make for the nearest shore if she would escape the storm that promised to break any minute the yellow sandbar that thrust itself out into the water was the nearest patch of earth with quickened strokes she turned towards it the blinding lightning flashing at briefest intervals the terrific crashes of thunder and the violent pitching of the little boat were enough to make a stouter heart quail but bravely she struggled on and at last breathless and almost exhausted she reached the bar hastily she leaped out of the boat flung the anchor ashore and hurried to a group of scrub pines the only protection poor though it was within sight scarcely had she reached them when the storm broke about her there she was alone not a house or a human being in sight the torrents of rain but slightly broken by the trees under which she stood the squall passed as suddenly as it came leaving the sky clear and the hills of a still deeper green the blue water no longer vehement murmured of the dangers past dripping from head to foot with each golden-brown lock curled tight in the downpour her face pink from the plashing of the rain her dark eyes glowing from the thrilling experience on the lonely sandbar betty was like some water sprite as she sprang into her boat and sculled for home hoping that she had not been missed by old katy for it was too early for her father and mother and lois to have come back from the city hello there she heard a clear boyish voice call betty turned and saw the clamor boy rowing swiftly towards her why where have you been you look like a-a drowned rat don't be polite i know just how i look only it would be prettier to say mermaid interrupted betty laughing nervously happy to see a human face and hear a friendly voice but where have you been insisted craig oh watching the storm from a splendid position the sandbar answered betty nonchalantly pointing to her late refuge but the poor girl's heart was fluttering and she hid her exhaustion with difficulty were you out in that storm asked the lad incredulously yes don't i look like it i'm very at least i watched the storm with much interest betty feeling on the verge of a breakdown was determined to allow no pity that would precipitate it gee willikins muttered the youth while he gazed at betty admiringly say bet you must have been scared betty tossed her head knowing craig's unfavorable opinion of girls bravery she certainly would not confirm it 
it was a glorious sight it made all my worries so small for the moment she added for a sense of her old failures began to creep over her as she approached the shore what have girls to worry about demanded the boy well if you had had three letters no two letters and one awful perfectly awful bill sent to you in one afternoon you would know what girls have to worry them said betty indignantly what were they he asked with characteristic directness two began with we regret odious way and the other she felt this would floor him for fertilizer and seeds and things pooh scorned the boy you ought to see my bills this is scientific farming you put everything into the soil you enrich it you use the best seeds you have the best methods it's scientific it's the only way he cried enthusiastically betty felt her heart warm it could never remain indifferent to the ideal yet certainly his admissions were damaging put everything into the soil she had wished to get a few things from it was the game worth the candle was it enough to be simply scientific she feared she had a petty soul though thus far the doing held a large part in her plans and endeavors the ideal had not even now sunk to where she could see mere figures only she brightened visibly until his next remark roused her as for literature he went on loftily it takes years and years and years to do anything how about pickles betty snapped too tired to be long transcendental craig's exalted look fell he saw betty shiver and like the dear boy he was he swung his boat up to hers jerked off his coat and put it round her despite her protests then tired and worn her chest heaved under the boy's coat and bursting into tears betty lost all hope of being the paragon of her sex in his eyes yet those eyes were very tender as he looked at the bowed head and he kept saying now there i say now there until betty laughed and cried together as the two came to the shore jack brooks passed in his car with his mother look jack there is that sweet pretty girl i talked with at the dory race your little girl miss baird you know cried mrs brooks betty dripping and forlorn walked slowly up the shore followed by craig ellsworth by george it is and soaked through evidently out in that terrific storm replied jack and he stopped the car with a jerk in a moment he had leaped out and was running to betty what in thunder he began and stopped betty laughed that's just it in thunder lightning and in rain mrs brooks leaned out to the limp girl get in and let us take you home she said oh thank you mrs brooks i am soaking and would ruin everything i have only a short walk cried betty jack simply took her by the arm and before she knew it she was in the seat beside mrs brooks craig on jack's invitation sat in front with him poor poor child soothed mrs brooks her gentle blue eyes soft with sympathy how did it happen i was paddling alone and slid down on the bottom of the boat and closed my eyes and drifted too far how reckless cried mrs brooks you must be more careful in the future promise me she added tenderly for she felt a strong attraction to the young impulsive girl by her side it was foolhardy wasn't it admitted betty with a candor that never failed her in any contemplation of her own mistakes i shall certainly promise as they rode up to the baird home mrs brooks cried out i didn't know you lived here in this eden i have often admired it it's an ideal situation looking off to the sound and what a delightful garden mrs brooks grew more and more enthusiastic as they came to the porch look at those fan lights it's simply great interjected her son who enjoyed making his dignified mother use his own language occasionally and she never failed to be shocked as he hoped mrs brooks remained in the car while betty and her two knights walked up the dusky garden 
katie hearing voices came round the house and craig told her briefly about betty's escapade and without ceremony the old cook hurried her pet indoors where betty was soon drinking hot tea to the monotonous scolding of the affectionate old woman who pattered to and from the kitchen on her errands of mercy to the naughty child end of chapter thirteen recording by holly jensen chapter fourteen of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter fourteen betty visits uncle goldstein betty was baking her sleeves were rolled up and her white dress was almost completely hidden by a blue gingham apron the quick skilful movements of the graceful hands and white arms seemed part of the dancing sunlight of this bright september morning as betty kneaded and tossed and cut and patted she sang hummingly for a while then her voice broke out in trills again as the work grew more intricate she fell into soft whisperings and low murmured tunes when she lifted her head from the table and moulded the doughy loaves into final shape a burst of song broke forth as if it had been imprisoned mrs baird could almost follow each step of betty's progress by the notes she heard sometimes with songs gay and happy she lilted like a bird but usually because of long association she sang some grand old hymn that she had been brought up on as she put it betty had learned to bake bread under old katie's direction it was only a few weeks from the first trial that katie asked mrs baird how do you all like the bread this evening miss helen it was quite as good as usual i think katie answered mrs baird unsuspiciously mr baird said again as he does so often that no one can make bread like you why do you ask did anything go wrong in the kitchen for answer katie put her hands on her hips and laughed until the window panes fairly rattled and betty and lois came running out scuse me miss helen she finally said when she stopped to take breath scuse me but did you tell mother betty broke in jes gwine to tell her honey when you all bust in dat bread miss helen was done baked by dis young sprig here i didn't do a thing but watch and mighty little o dat you baked that bread betty dear questioned mrs baird incredulously betty nodded her head very proudly i did it with my little hands she confessed we didn't tell you for i wanted to see what you and father would say your father will be delighted betty said mrs baird who herself was far from showing any depression over betty's new accomplishment from that time no one's bread but betty's would satisfy dr baird and to-day she was again exercising her skill betty called her mother standing in the doorway and smiling as she always did when she saw her young daughter well and happy she stood a moment watching betty's agile motions before she again interrupted the bread-making and the song in her hands she held a letter and glancing down at it she went over to betty and putting her hand over her mouth kissed her on her cheek to make her aware of her presence if i were not so flowery carissima i'd give you a hug for my bread is coming on beautifully don't let flowery hands control your enthusiasm i know how pleased one is when baking is a success and my dress will wash betty threw her arms around her mother taking care to hold out the whitened hands so they would not touch the pretty morning dress this is loving under difficulties she exclaimed transferring a spot of flour to her mother's cheek from her own and then trying to wipe it off with her flowery hands dear me why can't i learn to bake without making such a mess cried betty taking up her apron and rubbing the flour off never mind child i have something to discuss with you when you have finished your baking we will go out on the porch what is it asked betty a letter your father received last night it is important and will take a little time now let's be off cried betty and she slammed the stove door and fanned herself vigorously with her handkerchief it doesn't seem fair to discuss these financial matters with you betty said her mother as they sat down on the porch chairs your problems will come soon enough 
i want you to have a bright memory of your home after we are gone mrs baird smiled pensively however i think you should have a voice in settling this as it will concern you largely now mother said betty with that air of thorough practicality she assumed when any one was low-spirited i love to wrestle with a difficulty and my memories hanging in my memories hall will be as sunny as apricots on the sunny side of an old red wall even if we do have troubles such are my troubles mr wesley said the man when his maid dropped coals on the floor maybe the troubles of the baird family won't seem any more serious to future generations now let us have a heart-to-heart -heart talk about debts betty slid to the porch floor and stretched herself comfortably by her mother's side mrs baird was laughing and the lines between her calm eyes disappeared while her daughter talked on in her light-hearted way betty saw that she had accomplished her end and sat up a trifle more dignifiedly this house must be paid for the interest and taxes and insurance are eating into our salary she began nimbly like one reciting a lesson we are buying this house for our old age explained her mother looking serious well so far as i can see we shall have it for our old very old age when does old age begin most virulently when no one wants you around said mrs baird with simple directness why mother that sounds bitter said betty looking into her mother's face with its gentle dignity and delicate refinement no i merely mean that there will come a time when your father will be superannuated and then we shall need a home and a place that will perhaps yield a little income besides your father loves to potter round a garden only he never has had time betty smiled to herself this legend of her father's love for an out-of-door life had been faithfully handed down to her but in her rather unfeeling youth she firmly believed that he loved his study with its old books and pictured faces beyond any garden or orchard and that this myth would one day be exploded your father is fifty said mrs baird after a long silence his hair is quite gray and he is not growing the least bald interrupted betty hopefully his hair is so thick with a beautiful pepper and salt effect he doesn't look a day over forty but to return to our financial difficulties said her mother smiling but to return to our debts our husband and father who wants to potter about the garden supplemented betty i have a plan i found ten books in the library that tell of hundreds of ways of earning a living a superb living at home it's so encouraging listen betty picked up one of four books she had thrown on the porch table that morning homemade furniture it looks as good as any boughten stuff home made made at home here's this book on hammered brass made at home and listen to this one girl made a handsome notice handsome not ugly income by making old-fashioned rugs made at home i could do any of these things here's another book that tells of two hundred and thirty-seven ways of making a living mrs baird smiled as betty ran on turning the pages and showing the pictures of the made-at-home products there should be no cause for discouragement surely but unfortunately our trouble now is one that demands an immediate remedy my daughter oh what is it mother i thought it was only the general situation i am glad it has narrowed down to something that means fight this letter says that the husband of your father's sister who died five years ago is dead leaving an only child a girl six years old your father must go on and see about her and bring the child here unless there are some of her father's relatives there to take charge of her oh mother i'd love to have a little girl live here cried betty clapping her hands in glee that is the point will it interfere with you i want you dear betty to make the choice i'll go for her myself the darling i love dotty and this little thing will be our very own i thought you would decide it that way now here is the other trouble it will take sixty-five or seventy dollars for your father's car fare and hers we haven't the money and as yet we don't see where it is coming from i could give up katie but that would be cruel she has always lived in our family 
john works the farm on shares and we have had small returns his bills for improvement silos fencing and so on have eaten up the income i never knew a farm that needed so many fences we pay for his labor john is an old skinflint i'll keep an eye on him said betty jovially she had not reached that age where the failings of others tend to embitter or to blind one to one's own faults if we can get through this winter her mother resumed i think we can do better next year but how can we get this extra money to bring little edwina here edwina what a funny name i'm sure she'll be as funny as her name exclaimed betty they were silent a few minutes when betty broke out impatiently oh mother how hard it is that horrid old money should come up as the one indispensable thing at every turn it isn't just yes little daughter but i am seeing even now that there are compensations how few mothers of the rich could talk with their children as i do with you and receive sympathy and understanding i'd have every bit as much sympathy and understanding carissima if i had a hundred dollars this minute betty answered lois would lend it she continued tentatively you know she is determined to pay board your father would never consent to borrowing from her said mrs baird firmly don't worry elizabeth i simply wanted to keep you informed of how our affairs are going especially when introducing a stranger into our home now i must go upstairs and finish my work mrs baird kissed betty lovingly and went into the house betty soon followed going to her own room to think out a plan there she sat for a long while pale and tense looking down into her clasped hands she shook her head slowly from time to time dismissing one plan then another as impracticable the deepening lines on her smooth forehead and the firm pressure of her lips showed that she was thinking with the determination to solve the problem she glanced at her literary table oh if she could only write something at the thought she shook her head vigorously no hope there while thinking she was playing with her ring and as she turned it and it flashed and glittered in the light she regarded it almost mournfully the ring was a charming one given to her by her cousin when she graduated from the pines it contained a large pearl surrounded by small diamonds betty knew it was valuable if we only had the money this cost and there is the wonderful diamond that mother gave me that belonged to grandmother and the locket with pearls and diamonds we have pearls and diamonds but no dollars i wish i could sell them but i can't sell an heirloom or a gift she flashed the ring round and round by association her mind went back a year or two when all the girls at school were reading all she hath by a popular writer a scene in the book stood out before betty's eyes the poor wife in abject poverty with her husband sick at home was pawning her wedding ring with a jerk betty started to her feet and a bright smile came to her face why not pawn her ring in the locket and if necessary her grandmother's diamond ring too several times she walked up and down her room saying i'll do it i'll do it then she ran to lois crying i have it i have it what have you asked lois looking up with interest from her desk and expecting to see at least an acceptance slip in betty's hand i can't go into details now lois for i must make plans we need seventy dollars and i am going to pawn my ring and maybe other things too we must go to the city tomorrow with father you heard jack tell those interesting stories about the boys pawning oh betty but not ladies cried lois yes ladies most of all betty answered authoritatively why have you forgotten that perfectly lovely lady in all she hath who pawned her wedding ring we all cried then i remember it was very very sad answered lois thoughtfully the sad memory did not seem altogether heartbreaking for she quickly looked up at betty with a pleased smile it was romantic i wonder if i couldn't pawn something too how would this do she asked and she glanced over her rings and selected one with a choice pearl of course you could and that ring is the very thing assented betty heartily now full of the flavor of the dramatic side of their troubles 
her happy young imagination soon alchemized difficulties into delightful adventures however they had a very serious conversation lois insisted on lending the money and wept at betty's refusal she determined to get ahead of her proud friends who gave all in hospitality yet refused to see any obligation indeed they could not see it for it was a privilege to have betty's friend with them where are you going lois asked have you the address of a reliable place betty held up a pawnbroker's business card jack brooks gave it to me the other night as a souvenir the address is on it he said it was a safe place and in a sufficiently respectable neighborhood as he expressed it wasn't it curious that we had that talk about it mother was so interested in his clever manner of imitating his uncle as he called the pawnbroker now her poor daughter will have an uncle it certainly would have been sad if betty's face had not been wreathed in smiles as she spoke in pensive tones lois laughed and they began to make preparations for the visit when the two girls had minutely planned the expedition betty told her mother at first her mother's horror almost overwhelmed betty but when she had promised to take all precautions and to run no risk mrs baird gave her consent since there was no other way out of the difficulty and it was impossible at that time for any one else to go the next day the two girls went to new york with dr baird and after making arrangements to meet him at luncheon they left him almost stealthily they studied the piece of paper with mr goldstein's address before asking a big policeman how to get there at last they were fairly started on their errand and sat in the cars shivering with excitement betty had the precious belongings carefully hidden she feared they would be stolen and the girls watched everyone suspiciously after leaving the car and walking a short block they entered a narrow crooked street filled with the din of a city's poor district and the sights and sounds that prosper under dark overhanging houses fortunately they had to walk but a few steps down this street until they reached the place jack brooks called at the sign of the three golden goose eggs involuntarily glancing around to see if they were observed they hurried through the doors that opened quickly and noiselessly as though to conceal their entrance everything they noticed was planned to hide the confusion of the client they walked into a small room and going up to the counter betty faced a short wizened man who proved to be mr goldstein himself much to betty's surprise he looked very human far from being an ogre the old man was very much like other men he pointed her to a stall jutting out into the room where she and her transactions would be completely hidden it was done quietly and secretly a secrecy not lacking in charm to the two trembling girls the pawnbroker called the number of the ticket belonging to someone else through a little barred door that stood at the head of a flight of steps evidently the vaults were under the sidewalk how thrilling thought betty and she shivered luxuriously at the thought of subterranean vaults at her first taste of the makeshifts of genuine poverty it was all immensely more romantic than genteel poverty where people pinch along yet have to maintain an appearance of prosperity mr goldstein made a close examination of the stones and betty received sixty-five dollars forty on the locket and twenty-five on her ring again in the street car betty and lois were soon comparing notes on this new experience it wasn't half as terrible as i anticipated i expected to see broken hearts and tearful ladies all about the place laughed betty why the old man was almost nice no shylock surely sighed betty that reminds me of the interest how much must you pay asked lois when they went over the business side of the transaction and calculated the interest charges carefully they soon saw that while it was an easy way to get money it was by no means a cheap way in fact it was evident that the interest would in a comparatively short time equal the principal and their dismay was overwhelming i shall take the tickets back right away betty said despondently no you can't you need the money at once there will be some way out for the interest you have done it for the best comforted lois End of chapter fourteen
Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 15 of Betty Baird's Ventures by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 15 Edwina from the West. The next Saturday, Edwina was to come from the West with Dr. Baird to her new home on Long Island. Betty went to meet them at the station. As the train stopped, she scanned the passengers who were pouring out of the cars at last the tall spare dignified figure of her father appeared and stepping down he lifted a small black bundle of a child to the platform oh said betty how tiny as tiny as dot the little girl bent down gravely smoothing out her dress then lifted her head and looked at betty whom the doctor had pointed out from the window she gazed long never taking her eyes off the smiling face of her newly found cousin betty nodded again and again but edwina only stared at her until suddenly growing shy she hung her head and would hardly look up give me a kiss cousin black eyes cried betty as the child climbed sedately into the cart edwina turned her thin face up for the caress but did not answer it she was suffering from an attack of bashfulness you must be horribly hungry edwina said betty holding the wee hand in hers then she turned her attention to merrylegs for she saw that the child was too keenly alive to her new surroundings to speak as they drove along in silence betty steadily keeping her eyes off the mite at her side she felt something warm on her arm glancing down out of the corner of her eyes she saw that edwina's head was bowed and tears were trickling from the olive cheeks to her sleeve very carefully as though unconsciously betty put her arm back of edwina and there in the soft curve of her new cousin's arm she wept silently yet soon to betty's joy with comfortable little sighs before long the tired child was asleep and dr baird carried her out of the cart and up to betty's room without waking her betty tiptoed around and in an hour edwina opened her eyes and sat up in bed as yet betty had not heard the sound of her voice your hair is like my dolly's came a high shrill voice from the bed at the first word betty ran to the child and sitting by her side drank in the amazing conversation my dolly's name is minerva father called her minerva because she was so smart she can shut her eyes and cry if you squeeze her very very hard and her legs and arms move up and down she can sit down you will dote on minerva i am sure i shall dote on minerva she must be a very bright lady to do all those things betty exclaimed nodding her head energetically father said minerva was a smart lady confirmed edwina can you sing i can and edwina began in a thin high-pitched voice to sing shall we meet beyond the river where the surges cease to roll mrs siggins taught me that she announced good cried betty clapping her hands now i'll wash your face and we shall have some dinner don't you want me to sing pull for the shore sailor not now edwina for it is dinner time and your uncle must not be kept waiting edwina was silent she was always silent except when inspired by some topic of deep interest and then she could not be kept quiet she loved her dolls madly as betty said and had little else to talk about with this strange cousin she looked at betty's belongings with well-bred restraint and betty wondered if mrs siggins had also taught her manners at dinner she ate in silence but whether from habit or shyness or homesickness no one could tell she was very thin and delicate looking and the plain black dress accented her appearance of orphanage her hair was long inky black and perfectly straight and her eyes a deep black it was decided that she was to sleep with betty until she felt more at home then she would have one of the rooms opening out of betty's when bedtime came she knelt by her bed for a long time and when betty went to her she found her fast asleep clasping in her arms a small dirty rag doll 
she must have smuggled it into her dress and held it there through all the journey and no one could tell what comfort and companionship the lonely child had found in her doll from home betty lifted her so gently that she only sighed and turned over on her side then clutching the doll and smiling she lay quiet blue monday surely this is the equinox cried betty she looked out of the window and saw the wind and rain pelting the late flowers and bending the tree branches the window glass was more like old-fashioned crinkle glass than the brilliant panes that katie kept in dazzling condition little edwina sat up in bed rubbing her eyes a moment or two then turned and buried her head in the pillow crying and sobbing until lois came running barefoot to see what the trouble was betty flew over to her and snatching her up began walking up and down she and lois talking soothingly and trying to divert her edwina cried on in a loud hearty way that seemed more natural than the silent tears of the day before betty walked with her until the sobs ceased and edwina crawled out of her arms on to the bed and began to suck her thumb it was the rain betty edwina whispered as betty carried her downstairs father is out in it the baby lips trembled and betty kissing them had only time to whisper no pet he is not there your father is in heaven where they don't have pouring rains like this only gentle showers i guess that make the flowers and grass grow lois and mrs baird were bringing in the breakfast for dr baird was late and betty putting the dictionary on a chair for her little cousin to sit on began to help the homesick child now what shall we do on this rainy morning children betty turned to lois and edwina with her funny little smile that already edwina was beginning to treasure and to smile at in response i have a box of marshmallows let us go into the hall and toast them at the fire proposed lois that is the very thing cried betty lois vanished upstairs and brought down a large box of the sweetmeats come let us go at once lois said unless there is something we can do here mrs baird no thank you lois there is nothing at present they found a fire blazing on the hearth and with the red and the green apples shining from a sheffield basket and snowy cubes of delicious marshmallows ready for the long silver toasting fork the hall was so cheerful and cosy that they forgot the dreary sky and torrential rain outside soon the hall was filled with the delicious savor of toasted sweets followed by the more pungent fragrance of roasted apple how the appetizing smells and the crackling logs and the dancing firelight seemed to mingle and fuse to give out autumnal good cheer after they had eaten the apples and the marshmallows betty proposed a game what shall it be edwina let's play lady edwina answered how do you play it maybe we don't play it the same way the child looked elfishly wise as she answered i used to put on papa's big coat and gloves i turned in the fingers and i wore mrs siggins apron for a trail mrs siggins was the lady that scrubbed for me and papa then i'd call on mrs siggins and on minerva and then on the authors in the parlor the authors queried betty there were a lot of men and ladies sitting and standing and all of them were so nice and kind looking they would look at me and listen when i talked to them one lady had long curls pictures said betty to lois in an undertone i wish you would make me a bride said edwina i saw a bride in a church and she walked up this way with a long veil and she paced with measured step up and down the hall lovely cried betty and there is a beautiful long long veil in the closet i am going to get for you she went to the closet and fished out several yards of old mosquito netting which the girls draped artistically over the child's head oh you darling thing they cried kissing her edwina stepped demurely to the measure of the wedding march that betty played on the piano then ran out to the kitchen to show her finery to katie then upstairs and brought down minerva for whom again she had to march up and down the hall now what next cried lois as betty left the piano edwina hasn't seen the duck my beautiful blimac foot he is a duck to be sure wait betty cried and ran out of the hall door
there she goes without a thing on her head said lois here she comes cried edwina her nose flattened against the window and excited over the prospect of seeing the duck that was a perfect duck betty's hair was glistening with raindrops and her cheeks were like young apples in a shower you must be wringing wet said lois reproachfully the storm is over it is only drizzling now i love to feel the rain on my face betty was smoothing blymac foot's ruffled feathers perfect little duck of a duck now be good and show off for the lady blymac foot is lame but only a little see its black feet that's why i call it blymac foot edwina looked puzzled blymac foot blymac foot she repeated slowly betty and lois laughed hilariously no wonder you don't understand it said lois it is one of betty's little whims that are very very hard to understand until they are explained very clearly indeed trust me edwina and list not to the words of mine enemy thus it was at first i called him blackfoot then i changed that to my blackfoot then i switched the letters around as i often do for words are a heap funnier transposed to blymac foot that's simple enough tell edwina how you found him said lois sit down i prithee sweet bride for like the ancient mariner i have a long tale to unfold said betty pointing to the great chair by the fire edwina entered into the play and sat down sedately the duck was wobbling around much to her delight it hasn't much of a history poor blymac foot betty said compassionately taking him in her arms one day i was down on the bridge looking at the water i was horribly homesick just as you are now cousin edwina i'm not interrupted edwina emphatically i was yesterday terrible but i'm not now well sweetie i'm glad you are not and don't you be homesick again ever to resume the thread of my discourse i was homesick as i said and as mistress edwina isn't any more and i spent half my time that first week mooning around the water well i heard a splashing and a laughing and i looked around and there i saw two boys persecuting this duck this perfect duck i ran to them as fast as i could and ordered them to stop the big hulks jeered at me asked if it was my duck said they had found it and they would keep it and treat it as they liked and no girl could keep them from it i grabbed the duck and quick as lightning i was running down the road to our house with them after me i met the miller and asked him about the duck and the boys slunk away thus blymac foot came into my life i love blymac foot he's very intelligent and has great versatility blymac foot's biography finished the three and the perfect duck went to the piano to sing and how they sang little edwina could sing any tune that betty started for the child had a throat like a bird's she knew a great many hymns for her father had taken her to church since babyhood betty brought out the family hymnal and their fresh young voices sang the hymns sung through the generations how firm a foundation rock of ages and others then came zion's hill betty noticed that edwina did not join them can't you sing it she asked after the first stanza looking down at the child in surprise edwina hung her head and remained silent what's the matter asked betty briskly you said the child stopped go on i said what betty urged you said a swear word finished edwina severely a swear word exclaimed betty and lois simultaneously a swear word they repeated wonderingly you said confounded i know it's a swear word for william used it and mrs siggins wrecked at him every time peals of laughter greeted this explanation oh oh you mean all her foes shall be confounded edwina sat up straight and her pale cheeks flamed mrs siggins says tain't polite to laugh at people betty caught her in her arms mrs siggins is right said betty trying to keep her eyes meek and her mouth from smiles no doubt mrs siggins is right about everything admirable mrs siggins 
no it is not polite to laugh at people but edwina please forgive us this time and won't you be a little weenty teenty laughy yourself sometimes lois and i are thereafter they waited breathlessly for mrs siggins nuggets of wisdom shortened by betty to siggins nuggets betty gave edwina a penny every time she handed out one of these stored treasures it was the signal for inevitable laughter and edwina who childlike grew to think that to produce such hearty laughter was something to be proud of soon lost all sensitiveness and appeared aggrieved if her remarks did not send betty off into joyous exclamations edwina quickly became one of the household and in time mrs siggins grew fainter much to betty's regret for she had begun a division in her commonplace book next to the one for original thoughts which she had headed siggins nuggets end of chapter fifteen recording by holly jensen